he has a lot of great ideas. He's not a stupid man. He's worth $9 billion. I feel like our country is going down the drain. He is actually a very intelligent man who cares deeply about America. There is no question that this is the person who will go to Washington, D.C. and be able to absolutely turn the place around. Hello, and welcome to Trumpcast. I am Leon Nafok, a writer at Slate, and I'm filling in today for Jacob Weisberg. Today in the show, we will hear what it's like to be one of the, quote, disgusting reporters covering Trump's campaign. But first, last week, Morning Joe's Mika Brzezinski asked Donald Trump whom he regularly consults for advice on foreign policy. Trump's reply, I'm speaking with myself, number one, because I have a very good brain. My primary consultant is myself, and I have a good instinct for this stuff. We were fortunate enough here at Trumpcast to receive an actual recording of a future gathering of Trump's foreign policy team. We will play that for you now. Every point on foreign policy you hear comes directly from something Mr. Trump has said or written publicly. Okay, guys, it's spectacular to sit down with you guys, frankly. Thanks for coming down to Mar-a-Lago. Look, the Situation Room in the White House is first class, but this one is truly amazing. Am I right? Absolutely incredible, incredible, Mr. President. Just amazing. China. Okay. I mean, our nation is in serious trouble. We're getting absolutely schlonged by these guys. I have great respect for China, but we need a plan. Chinese leaders are not our friends, Mr. President. If we're going to make America great again, we've got to get tough with China. You're so right about that. You know, you really, really are. Look, I love China. The Great Wall of China built 2,000 years ago is 13,000 miles, Mr. President, and they didn't have caterpillar tractors. It really is absolutely amazing. amazing. Okay, Syria, Middle East, ISIS, these are not good people. I would love not to be over there. I'd blow up every single inch. That's not our fight. That's other people's fights. That's revolutions. That's whatever you want to call it, religious wars. Let's bomb the holy crap out of ISIS. And you know what? You'll get Exxon to come in there. And in two months, you ever see these guys? They'll rebuild that sucker brand new. And it'll be very, very beautiful. It'll be absolutely incredible, frankly. I don't like the migration. I do not like the people coming. What they should do is the countries should all get together, including the Gulf states Fantastic. who have nothing but money. And they should take a big swath of land and they should do a safe zone for the people and then ultimately go back to where they came from. Incredible. I'm all for it. 100%. Guys, it's break time. We'll talk Mexico and Putin after lunch. You guys really are fantastic employees. Just just amazing. Wait till you see the lunch we have. Top people working on this lunch. The best of the best. Just incredible. I'm joined now by Seth Stevenson, who wrote Slate's fantastic cover story this week titled A Week on the Trail with the Disgusting Reporters Covering Donald Trump. How's it going, Seth? It's going well. How are you, Leon? So there's a moment I loved in the piece where you say that you felt on edge the whole time because you didn't know whether, you know, the next scuffle or the next confrontation that was going to erupt was, was going to be the big one, whether it was going to be the one that, that, that led to something truly tragic happening. Um, can you describe what that felt like? Yeah, so for the reporters who've been going to these rallies for a while, I mean, this has been going on for a while now, and they're pretty inured to it. They notice the stuff going out in the stands, but they're so used to it that in some ways I I feel like they don't quite understand how weird it is because the only other campaign that I had covered this year was was Jeb Bush um, in South Carolina where I spent a week on the trail with his campaign. And that was like 40 people sitting on folding chairs calmly asking questions of Jeb Bush. There There was no media pen in almost any of those events and you could sort of freely mingle with the voters. And then I showed up at the Trump things and suddenly we're in this pen and there's just people screaming all around, occasional altercations. And it was... It was bizarre, and I really was on edge. I mean, that Chicago event was was scary. I mean, I, at one point, I was out on the arena floor surrounded by people scuffling. I wasn't sure what was going to happen next. One of the reporters at that event actually got slammed to the ground by police and detained in jail. It was crazy, but what was so interesting to me is when I talked to the reporter, especially that first night in Chicago before anything had really gone down, 
Um, and pro protesters had started jumping up and shouting, and then the cops would escort them out. And to me, that was a big deal. But to them, they're like, oh, no, that, you know, that just happens at every rally. No big deal. There's going to be 10 more of those tonight. Don't worry about it. But I, I, to, I couldn't get used to it. You know, and, the, and uh, at the town hall Trump held in Tampa while I was, while I was down there, um, a guy tried to rush the stage and was shouting, you're a fascist, at the top of his lungs and got tackled by law enforcement. That, that's not something I'm used to. And the events I've covered, that these are not things that, come, that typically happen. Uh, one of the recurring uh, tricks that Trump uh, deploys on stage, it seems, is to literally point at the press pen and, and, and call them disgusting and call them dishonest. What did that feel like to be to be uh, to be the target of that? Right. I mean, all candidates will will talk about the media and grumble about the media. And, and you know, you'll and you'll hear the their supporters sort of grumble along with them. But this is a lot more pointed. I mean, he he, he literally points at us and says, look at those people back there. And all his supporters turn around and boo and jeer. Um, and occasionally he has even singled out individual reporters. You know, Katie Turr is a television correspondent for, for NBC. And, you know, he, he's called her out by name uh, at a rally. So somewhat disastrous results where, you know, sometimes he's done this and people have jeered her specifically. One, one time this happened, she tweeted about one time being in the pen and, and, and Trump calling out the media pen and a guy looks at her and says, you're a bitch. Uh, and another guy, you know, flips double birds at the camera. Um, you know, I think the reporters who are there are, again, are used to it and they kind of let it slide off them. And I think that, you know, they're not quite concerned for their safety that like there's going to be a mob overrunning the, the gates of the pen and, 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 and just starting a melee with them. I don't think they're exactly scared in that sense. But one reporter did say he, you know, he, he wouldn't be surprised if at some point somebody threw something hard into the pen and hit somebody. Mm -hmm. um, he said he wouldn't, it wouldn't at all shock him if that happened. And for me, as someone who hasn't been sitting there and listening to Trump say this stuff about the press for months on end, I bridled at it. I didn't enjoy having him be up on stage and you know, remember his his Trump his, Trump's uh, stump speech is just full of lies, like obvious whoppers, like just provable lies. <laughs> you know, the entire time, and then he'll pause in between telling outright lies to point at the press pen and say, "Really dishonest people in there." I gotta <laughs> tell you, so dishonest. I just seethed when that happened. I mean, that that that's absurd. These people are trying to do a job, and 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 for the most part, especially like the straight news reporters, um, are covering him as fairly as they can. I mean, they're just trying to report stuff. They're not trying to take an angle. They're trying to report what he said and then fact check it. Um, and I was angry on their behalf. <laughs> I couldn't let the lies wash over me. You know, there, it's one thing to point the press. I also didn't like the fact that he would repeat the same lie like three times in a speech. And so one time this happened where he said, oh, America has zero GDP. We've got zero GDP. And the third time he said it, I, I said out loud, quietly, but I said it out loud in the press band, that's not true. Nope, that's, that's just not true. I just couldn't let it stand. Something inside of me, it was like an involuntary response, just could not brook that lie anymore. But I think if you have listened to these lies over and over and over again for a period of months, then it's just Trump being Trump, and you, and you got to do your best, and you, and, and you try to fact check what you can, but you can't possibly fact check you know three dozen lies in the course of one speech if you want to thoroughly fact check them and still file your story right after the rally ends. So right i don't i just don't envy these people um when you were when you were uh, in chicago i remember there's a moment when you described the journalist deciding to jailbreak uh, and escape the pen uh and that made me wonder what, what's the relationship like between trump's security and secret service protection and the journalists are the journalists scared of crossing these guys um how do they feel about them I wouldn't say they're scared, but there's this weird thing. So you check into the media pen at Trump events, and you can freely go in and out before the event starts and go talk to voters. And a lot of the journalists do talk to voters, and they're excited to talk to voters. And that's at least one reporter said it was her favorite part of the job was going out <clears throat> and talking to the voters at these events to find out what it is they like about Trump and, and what they're looking for um, in, in this upcoming election. And um, that's great. Um, but about 15 or 20 minutes before Trump is scheduled to arrive, um, campaign volunteers or workers, it's sort of unclear who they are, will sort of seal off the entrance to the pen and say, okay, uh, everyone in is in and everyone out is out. Um, and until Trump leaves the premises after the event ends, you are here in the media pen. So you kind of have this choice. If you want to be separated from the crowds and have a table to work at and outlet to plug your laptop into um, and just be able to really work and, and start writing your, up your story because you're going to have to file it soon after the rally ends, then you kind of need to be 
in the media pen. But if you want to be up close for when these altercations start happening in the crowd and you want to um, have the scoop on that and, or maybe film that if you have a camera, then you need to be out uh, in the crowd, which you can't be. And so one time I was in the media pen in Cleveland and I tried to leave it. Um, I just need to use the restroom. And this young woman in a Trump t-shirt tried to stop me and, and, and she said, and this was telling, I'm not sure if she'd been more savvy, she would have said this, but she said, we were told not to let you filter out into the crowd, um, which made it pretty clear to me that someone higher up in the campaign didn't want us out there in the crowd during the event. Mm -hmm. um, and there are different theories about why that is. Um, a, a lot of reporters seem to think it was so that they couldn't cover those altercations or film them. Mm -hmm. um, there was at least one BuzzFeed piece that said that the, the cameras on tripods, the big network cameras on tripods filming the event, it was they were placed in the pen and, the Trump, and, and Trump wanted them in the pen so they would have a certain angle on Trump and only be able to sort of film him from head on, which maybe would disguise how big the rally really was or would help Trump control his image, which I, I think he's very concerned about, you know, exactly how he's going to be broadcast. He's very media savvy in that way. Um, but that media pen stuff is weird. And at least at, at the Boca rally, there was one example where a Sun Sentinel reporter had gone in with the regular crowds, was out in the crowd filming and taking photographs. Um, and uh, he was threatened with arrest. Um, some cops and some Trump security came over and said, you can't do that. And he said, sure I can. And then he said, no, it's a private event. And he was actually threatened with arrest if he didn't stop filming. So there's a lot of control over whether you can be inside or outside of the pen. And, and I think other campaigns sometimes will have pens of a sort, and they will try to pen up journals to some extent. But I don't think it's nearly to the same extent that it happens at these Trump events. Mm -hmm. I feel like with other campaigns, the protocol is that you know, you you hammer out these kinds of boundaries or, or ground rules with the campaign staff, the, the the communication staff. They have a bunch of people who are whose job it is to deal with journalists, to help the journalists get what they need. In your piece, you write that this kind of apparatus is all, all but absent in the Trump campaign. Um, the one person who does this job uh, seems to be Hope Hicks, right, the, the the campaign's chief spokesperson. How does she figure into the lives of the journalists that you that you spend time with? What kind of presence is she in their in their lives? The the universal thing that I heard from reporters on the Trump campaign trail when I, I would ask, so what is it like to deal with the Trump press operation? And they they all would say, there is no Trump press operation. Yeah, so on other campaigns, you will have a press team with multiple people who will direct you to someone to help you. Let's say you have a question about women's issues. They'll direct you to the press liaison who handles women's issues or Hispanic issues. They'll have a specific point person on that. There will be donors who will talk to you and sort of give you some inside sco scoop or pollsters or ad makers, advisors, which is something you know Trump basically uh, – until uh, today he announced a foreign policy advisor, but he basically really hadn't revealed – who he's talking to, who his advisors are. So there, there's kind of no one to talk to uh, on the campaign other than Trump himself. Um, you know, one of the reporters said, well, usually I'd be sourced up on a campaign. I'd have all these other people to talk to and sort of get mm -hmm. skinny on what's really happening, but that doesn't happen here. Everything's on the surface. All you can do is report what Trump said and then interpret it. And Trump's campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, will sometimes talk on the record to reporters. Hope Hicks doesn't really – so Hope Hicks is the media handler. And she's like 26 or 27, had never worked in politics previously. She'd been a Ralph Lauren model. And she handles the Trump press operation a little more like a PR celebrity shop than, than like a, a political press team. Um, and so she fields the emails and, and, and writes up press releases. But – uh, that seems to be about it. And, and when I say fields the emails, everyone said that they're incredibly non-responsive compared to other campaigns. Not even just, uh, like partly just on logistical issues. Like other campaigns will often be able to tell you where the candidate's going to be three days from now, where you, you know, if you need to plan your travel. That doesn't happen with the Trump campaign. You never know. And you just, they end up, the reporters end up refreshing his scheduling website, uh, you know, donaldjtrump.com slash schedule, the same way like a supporter would mm -hmm. look at the site and see if there's somewhere they could see a Trump rally. That's what the reporters had to do. They, they had to refresh that site to find out where he was going to be. And in terms of asking policy questions, you know, you email your policy question at Hope Hicks, a lot of the time you just don't get any response at all. Um, and when you do get a response, um, it's, it's rarely in, it, it's rarely sufficient. It's usually pretty bare bones. And what one reporter said to me was, well, there's kind of no point in asking these policy questions to the press team, uh, such as it is, because maybe they'll give you a policy position or clarification, but then that night on TV or at a rally, Trump will say something completely at odds with what you were told by right. the press team. <laughs> so then you go, you go back to the press team and say, well, wait a second, he just said this. 
and maybe they'll kind of change their answer to fit what he said or sort of fudge it a little bit. And then, you know, the next day he'll say something again at odds with that. And mm -hmm. so th it's sort of hard to pin him down on policy anyway. So there's not a lot of point in doing that. Um, and, all, you know, all of this just makes their jobs very hard. And, I, and I, some of the response I've gotten, most are, uh, not most of the response, but a, a little bit of the response I've seen from readers is, wah, wah, here's the press whining, go do your jobs. And the, believe me, they're trying to do their jobs. They're trying to cover this campaign as they would another campaign and try to figure out what policy issues are and try to nail down the candidate on those policy positions and ask about other policy positions that he hasn't yet made reference to. And all of that is just incredibly difficult to do on this campaign. You end your piece sort of with a, with a look forward to a Trump presidency in which this kind of uh, approach to the press uh, continues. Uh, what relationship do you think Trump, the president, would have with the press and how would that be different from you know, the way past presidents have, have, have dealt with it? It's unclear, and I think people are starting to be a little concerned about that. We've already seen the White House Correspondents Association, the National Press Club, um, start to make a little bit no of noise about how Trump has dealt with the press. Um, and I think, you know, in a lot of ways, if there were a Trump uh, administration, the, the, there's, a, you know, there's a great big machinery of bureaucracy um, in the American government, and, and some of what the president can do, as we've seen with President Obama, is muted by that. But in terms of how you deal with the press, that is uh, less constrained. And um, I think there would be room for a Trump presidency to really wall itself off from the press. I mean, they could, you see this now in the campaign where they have this incredibly small press team, which is in itself a strategy because when there's just no one in the press team, there's no one for the press to talk to. Um, there's no, you can't get a response because there's only one person handling all this stuff. And I think in a Trump White House, you might see the same thing where it's just incredibly hard to get any kind of response. And there are all sorts of norms that have traditionally governed how the White House deals with the media. Um, for instance, you know, on other campaigns at this point in the race, once a candidate is a front runner and you know, uh, even maybe even a presumptive nominee, they have a press charter plane so that the, the main media pack will move uh, in the plane along with the candidate within the Secret Service bubble going to place to place and there will often be a gaggle on the plane with the candidate. Trump doesn't do that. Trump flies on his private jet and reporters, the press pack, do not go on that jet and so they're forced to chase him around. Um, using commercial flights, which isn't always easy to do if you're trying to get a commercial flight from like Valdosta, Georgia to Huntsville, Alabama. It's it's hard to keep up with his private plane. Um, and a, a lot of the reporters said, well, it takes more than one person to cover him. If you want to be at all the events, you can't, one person can't possibly make it to all these things flying around chasing his jet. So what would happen if, if Trump is on Air Force One? Traditionally, the president brings reporters along on Air Force One. I and mean, we, see, we see that with this trip to Obama's trip to Cuba right now. Uh, would that happen at Trump presidency or would he just borrow reporters from Air Force One and make it Trump Force One um, and reporters would have to chase him around on commercial flights? There would be no gaggle in the back of the plane. Um, it's unclear. Um, would, would Trump just close down the White House briefing room? Um, again, unclear. Would Press Secretary Hope Hicks respond to policy questions. Um, she doesn't do that right now as Trump's, you know, uh, running Trump's press operation during the campaign. Uh, why would that necessarily change if Trump were president? Who knows? I mean, this is stuff that's, that's up for debate, um, but it, I think it, it's something that should definitely be of concern. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you for going on this hellish trip. Seth Stevenson is a reporter at Slate. You can read his cover story this week at slate.com. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time, Seth. Thanks, Leon. That's it for today's episode of Trumpcast. Tell us what you think of the show by giving us a rating and review on iTunes. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you get every episode as soon as we release it. And you can find me on Twitter at Leon Kral. Trumpcast is produced by Henry Milofsky and Jason DeLeon. The Trump Situation Room was performed by John DiDomenico and was written by Ian Bremmer. He's fantastic. You can find him at johnnyd.net. Slate's executive producer is Steve Lichtai. Andy Bowers is our chief content officer. I'm leaving you with a clip from the Simpsons episode, Bart to the Future, which first aired 16 years ago and which predicted that the heir of a certain New York real estate fortune would end up as president of the United States. I'm Leon Nafok. Jacob Weisberg will be back later this week. Thanks for joining me on Trumpcast. As you know, we've inherited quite a budget crunch from President Trump. How bad is it, Secretary Van Houten? We're broke. The country is broke? How can that be? Well, remember when the last administration decided to invest in our nation's children? 
Big mistake. The Balanced Breakfast Program just created a generation of ultra-strong super criminals. And Midnight Basketball taught them to function without sleep. What about my pledge to build the world's largest bookmobile? Isn't there any money left for that? No. In every city, she encouraged them to enjoy what she called the cheerful hurly-burly of city life. In every town. And now we've just been around long enough and the town looks so much better. There are people who want to change things. And I thought, oh my gosh, that is so cool. Why can't we do that in my community and other communities everywhere? To make them better. My point to them is it can be better. It can be better than that. It'll be different. Or to protect things from getting worse. If you're a responsible person, you have to oppose Things that are dumped right on your neighborhood, right in an area that you know about. I'm Rebecca Shear, inviting you to check out Placemakers, the podcast from Slate Magazine about the spaces we inhabit and the people who shape them. Subscribe now to Placemakers. You'll never look at your community the same way again.